Jazz Pancake, Senior Artisans Editor at Variety, and I'm so excited to be here today. I'm your host for today's Half Hour with The Shepherd, and with us, we have writer and director Ian Softley. Hi, Ian. Hello there. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the Shepherd is such a beautiful story, and before we have this conversation, tell us a little bit, uh, you know, what is the story about? Um, well, it follows a young pilot uh, flying home on Christmas Eve. He's the last plane in the sky uh, in the late 1950s in one of the first jets, beautiful, sleek, retro, futuristic plane. Um, and it's a sort of dream for him, really. He's under the full moon and there's snow covered landscape. And the dream turns to a nightmare when halfway across the North Sea, he his instruments all fail um and he's getting ready to ditch in the sea his fuel's running out when in the fog beneath him he sees the apparition of a airplane and the story from then takes a very mysterious turning i love that okay let's take a look at the trailer did you have family in the force, sir? Yeah, my father. Missing in action over Germany. So you followed him into the force? Yeah, I did. You sure about this? You've only just got your night rating. It's a straight run across the North Sea. Perfect night for flying. Everything seems to have stacked up in your favor. Looks like you're going home for Christmas. Thank you, sir. Charlie Delta, emergency, calling all channels. Come in, multiple instrument failure, electrical failure. Fuel status critical. Why won't somebody listen to me? Please get me out of this bloody mess. All I wanted was to come home to spend Christmas with you. Mr. Johnny went out on his last patrol Christmas Eve 1943, just 14 years ago tonight. It, then I don't seem to be afraid anymore. He used to go out over the North Sea looking for a crippled plane, sometimes in fog, so dense. He couldn't see a hand. It's light tonight. Lord, please send someone to lead me down. As we saw, you know, this is based on the novella by Frederick Forsyth. Take us back about how it actually came your way. Uh, well, the first person to introduce me to the story was uh, was Richard Johns, uh, one of the producers, and he had been approached by John Travolta's agent, uh, alerting him to the fact that there was this beautiful Frederick Forsyth novella and that John Travolta was interested in being involved and helping it get to screen. Uh, John had um, actually optioned the book about 30 years ago when he, he intended to play the young pilot. Um, and so he had no idea at that stage that that I would want him to play the shepherd, the title role, or that he was even thinking about himself. It was only after I had adapted the novella into the screenplay and we, we talked further that it really became a kind of... Uh, uh, we almost, um, I, I sort of suggested it to him and he considered it. He was very uh, keen to know that we were going to make a film that was going to do justice to the book and that had, uh, that would be uh, correct in terms of its technicality, the attention to detail, but but more importantly, that somehow the emotion and the and the feeling that reading the book had given people would, would, would be um, at least equaled in the film. So he uh, he he then came on board. Um, uh, after I'd written the script, and um, I was also working with uh, one of the other producers, Bill Kenwright, who was incredibly supportive at the beginning of the process and actually optioned the book. Um, and Bill sadly died last week. Um, so you know we all feel that this is a um, a, a film that will be an amazing legacy for him. Um, 
but the next sort of the, the next person that took up the baton was was uh, my old friend Alfonso Cuaron. And I was told by my agent, um, Robert Newman, um, who is also Alfonso's agent, that Alfonso was interested in pursuing the story, which he had first heard as a child, uh, read to him in, in Mexico and had been in love with it ever since. And so when Alfonso heard that I was directing it, he said, well, it's a perfect film for my his Disney Plus um, uh, holiday season. Uh, which, which he was curating and he said well look you know I should do it with Ian he should do it with us and at that point um, we pretty quickly raced raced to production yeah what a I mean it's so interesting when you hear about you know the journey of how you know how something gets made and you know talking about adapting something you know the novella is so beloved when you're adapting you know something like like the shepherd like what was important to you in maintaining those qualities versus like okay how are we going to you know maintain the the christmas fate i guess mystery of it all versus you know just visualizing it into this incredible cinematic tale that we end up with well, I think initially two things happen. The first one is that I have to fall in love with the material. Um, and I imagine actors and I and I and I have to be convinced that it's going to be something that actors will want to do and that it will be an opportunity for them to give their best performances. Um, but I have to, as well as being intrigued and fall in love with the story, I, I have to see the film in my head. All the films that I have made from um, either pre-existing script or pre-existing piece of literary material, when I've read the source material, I've seen the film in my head. And that tells me I know how to do this. I know how to do this. And I'm excited by it. It's going to give me an opportunity, as it did with The Shepherd, to create a world, to create this magical world that lives above the Earth's surface, in the sky, you know, under the stars, which will be an amazing setting to tell this fable. Um, that has applications beyond. Um, and so that was really what made me uh, know that it was a film I, I had to make. But at the same time, uh, I knew that I had to uh, deliver something that worked for the fans of the book um, it, it, that that didn't that that paid uh, a sort of service to how effectively it draws people in, tells a story of suspense. Um, but ends with a very magical and an emotional conclusion. So I wanted all of that. I knew that that's what I had to uh, achieve. And um, th th then the other aspect of, of it was really a note of caution, which was how difficult is it going to be to have an actor in a plane for half of the film? Um, and how do we achieve those flying sequences, uh, which is a sort of a, 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 a story in itself um but it was really that idea um that, that i start off with like i can make this film and then the challenges emerge um and the two challenges uh that were uh, utmost in my mind initially um were i knew and, and in my adaptation that i i was going to depart from the story in the in the novella uh because the the, the technique that's used is is a is a narration so it's uh so the voice of freddie tells us what he's thinking and tells us the story it's like he's narrating his own story that's how the book works and i thought i don't want to have that um in the film so i had to uh find out a way of telling the story with all the beats with very little dialogue uh, and a big part of that was getting an actor who could convey the emotion and the internal story and who would uh, elicit an empathetic response from the audience. Um, and uh, the other challenge, as well as sort of making a, a film that 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 uh, honoured the way that the novella worked, was the technical um, uh, challenges. Uh, there, there, I knew very early on that there was only one flying uh, vampire in existence in the Northern Hemisphere. And in my research, I had contacted the, that that squadron, and I actually sat in the cockpit, and you know, when they started up the engine and everything, um, and uh, convinced them to fly over to Norfolk, 
where we'd found in a remote location, not only an authentic airfield that's described almost exactly as described by Frederick Forsyth in the book, but also uh, uh, a location that had been used for films before. So they were set up and we used one of the hangars as a CGI location. Uh, I knew that we were going to just use a cockpit of, of which there were a few that we found for the CGI work. But I wanted exterior scenes where we were using the real airfield with a real plane. Now, the the flying plane was couldn't land in the airfield because the the uh, uh, the runway had been shortened. Um, so the art department built a life size replica, which is what you see in the in the takeoff and the landing sequences, which they scoured the the uh, the countryside um, to find you know a rusted wing and a barn here uh, or a a rusted tail tail fin assembly in a in a shed you know on, outside a town somewhere. Um, so that was the most extraordinary thing and really pleased with the way that everybody pulled together to achieve that. But there was a third challenge, which was unforeseen, which was that we made the film when COVID was still very prevalent. So everybody had to test uh, every day before uh, getting it, uh, being allowed to enter the, the, the location. And everybody wore masks the whole time that we were that we were filming. So there were there were there was another challenge there. But I think it kind of brought everybody together. It, it, and much like one of the main ideas in the story is about people um, coming together and looking after each other. Yeah, I love that, and I love that you went into the details of how you pulled off the flying sequences because you know I was going to ask you about that. Okay, let's take a, a look at a clip from The Shepherd. Hey, no time to call your girlfriend. I'm gonna get you out of here tonight. All right, come on then. Talk to you from the tower. You'll turn on to a course 265, climb to 27,000 feet over the Dutch coast to the North Sea. Got it. Sixty-six minute flight. We've got fuel for more than 80 minutes in the air. Touchdown in Lake and Heath, 23-25. On reaching height, maintain course and keep speed to 350 knots. As soon as you leave our airspace, we'll be shutting down. You know, we have to give, a, you know, a shout out to Ben Radcliffe, who is so incredible in his performance to what you were saying earlier. Uh, you know, the emotion in his face and what you said, you know, isn't very heavy with dialogue. Talk about casting him and... Yeah, you know, what made him right for this role? Well, uh, just as a, a sort of a, a bit of background to the casting process, that, uh, that was during, again, lockdown. So I couldn't, I, I had to do all of the casting by Zoom, which was a challenge. And I actually had COVID in the, in the, in the crucial two weeks of casting. Um, but because of that, I was, uh, I was kind of super um, methodical. Uh, I probably did more callbacks than I would have done if we were in a live situation. But I had in my mind who I wanted for Ben when I was adapting the story, that I wanted somebody who who had that sort of self-confidence, self-reliance, the fact that he kind of didn't need any help. He knew what he was doing. It, it was his it was his time to fly this plane uh, back, that he deserved it. Uh, and then when he hits um, uh, his difficulties, 
we what's exposed is the fact that he's actually quite an inexperienced pilot and it's very challenging to him and i think that inexperience and that vulnerability makes us more empathetic to him so he actually has quite an emotional gamut um that that that, 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 that he has to furrow there um and uh in a way you can say it's a coming of age story that in the air he actually he, he he goes from being a boy to a man so i needed somebody who was both young enough to play the vulnerability but experienced enough to be able to play uh to be able to, to, to go through that 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 character journey of being very self-confident to being very vulnerable and then being very sort of humbled really by the end um and uh it's a different was a difficult ask i mean we saw lots of amazing actors but as soon as I saw Ben, I knew that he was the right guy. But I kept going, doing callbacks, having uh, having a number of people read. And as we went from stage to stage to stage, we got closer to the top of the pyramid, and and less and less people were involved. And it was, I, I was, I kind of knew that I was going to be more and more reinforced in my view that Ben was the right guy. And and he did, he did the most incredible job because it was a very difficult role, as you've identified, to to with very con in a very confined space for a lot of the film to have such a a, a detailed uh, and fully rounded performance of the emotional trauma and the and the internal journey he was going on talk about the mute the conversations you had about how music would help hit those emotional beats well i knew from the beginning that music was going to be incredibly important in this film partly because it was going to help to tell the story uh, as it replaced the, you know, the use of, of text and dialogue and, uh, and, and narration. I wanted the, uh, the music to be a sort of um, a, a, a ever present in the film. And I had an idea that I wanted something that would be very atmospheric, but that would help to describe the drama um, uh, so sort of a, a solely ambient track wouldn't work something that felt timeless but also had a contemporary feel um, and I worked with our music supervisor Simon Astor um, and he suggested a number of people and I picked Anne Chemlewski who, who who was our composer and one of the things that uh, really struck me about her and and how confident I was that we were going to get to the end position was with some of the as with some of the best composers I've worked with in terms of film was their understanding about the interactivity and the collaboration so she was completely open with me changing direction if I changed my mind about something she would try it out and there was it was part of the process for her she realized that that was part of the composition process as well so that we moved forward really quickly and that she would write very quickly. And if I gave her notes, and we we sat through the film numerous times in the uh, while we were finalizing the score, um, and and we went to Belgium to record it somewhere she'd worked before with the Brussels Philharmonic Orchestra, and she had a fantastic um, working relationship with this uh, with this orchestra. So it was still evolving um, and being perfected as we were in the studio. Um, and that was, and, and I think it's hugely successful. Uh, and, and I think it, it's a big part of um, what is there for people to enjoy and uh, be informed by in the storytelling. Talking about, you know, the world of the story, you know, we start off on the base and, and you know, he goes up and takes that flight. Um, you know, talk about, you touched on it a little bit too, of like finding the right, location to, to, to set this in and you know having a snow fight right at the beginning yeah but we wanted uh um well again it was another challenge because he talks about christmas a lot in the book he's talking about you know he's imagining what the scene is going to be at home so um uh i did have a couple of moments where he's imagining that, but I didn't want too many flashbacks because I didn't want to take the tension away from the cockpit. Um, but I wanted to make sure that, that the idea of Christmas was very embedded because in the book, the story starts on the runway. 
Uh, and I and I thought rather than cutting away with sort of you know to his home and to what was happening in 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 the in the world down there uh, at, at Christmas, um, I, I wanted to set up before he he took flight that that it was Christmas and that the base were having, was having a party. There was a snowball fight, which becomes part of the story. Uh, that we open with a a, a carol. Um, in the bleak midwinter that starts in English and goes through to German. We have the Carol of the Bells score um, as he's in the flying sequence uh, that he refers to Christmas a few times when he's interacting with us. I just wanted to sort of really, um, really hammer that in um, because it, it sort of pays off at the end um, in terms of storytelling. I absolutely have to talk to you about John Travolta, who we know is, is a trained pilot and can fly planes. Um, you know, talk about working with him, not just, you know, as, as an EP, but also like having him play the shepherd. Like when did that come into the conversation? It came into the conversation um, before Alfonso came on board, actually. And, and, and at that point he was, he was really attached. Um, and, uh, you know, we discussed the logistics of, of how we would film. We had to go to another location, which is where the Mosquito plane was based. Um, and he, it was, he, he went into really great detail because it was something that he was very familiar with, not just the story, but he knew the world. He knew about all the planes. He's a, he actually owned a vampire jet for about five years. Um, so he was an amazing resource and that, and that we, I rehearsed with him um with the cinematographer in the plane so we discussed you know angles we discussed how how the plane would be flown um because he had some insights into that um and and also some of the dialogue uh in terms of the dialogue what would be the authentic dialogue for somebody who was leading somebody down um so there so there was a lot of um collaboration on that and then as soon as we started filming um he just was he became the pilot he it seemed so natural to him because the combination of his love of the book and his uh expertise as a pilot just came together so it's it's a very natural but completely believable performance that has real dignity as well i i think it's um i think people will be very moved by his performance in the film yeah and you know we, we've talked about alfonso Cuaron, who you know, who is doing this, you know, this adds to his collection of short films, um, you know, on Disney Plus and, and Nat Geo. Talk about, um, you know, working with Alfonso and any, you know, the, the, the conversations you had about building this cinematic world. First of all, Alfonso said, I just want you to make your film. You know, I want, he says, I, 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 I you know, he was incredibly supportive. He said he knew that I, what I would do with it. Um, I think he responded to one of the things I've always tried to put in my films, which is to, to create a sort of quite a immersive, seductive world um, for the story to take place. Um, and he said, you know, really just let, just, just, you know, let your hair down, spread your wings, <laughs> what other, what, what, whatever else phrases he, he used. But he was very helpful and specific in terms of um, the script uh, he, 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 you know, he let me, he waited quite late in the process before he wanted to make his comments so that he could give them to me pretty much all at once, or maybe in two or three sessions. And that there were, there were very long conversations and very detailed. Uh, and, but all the time he said, take out of this, what's useful to you, which is, you know, for a director, a writer, it's, it actually makes you, it's a very uh, creative, um, process to be involved with because it gives you the confidence but it also gives you the confidence to say I'm going to take that idea of yours you know I didn't feel I needed to fight for or against anything it was really a very um very productive uh process and similarly when uh Alfonso saw the cut of the film his you know he would come back sometimes on different points or he'd come back reinforcing the same point maybe he felt you know that I hadn't you know taken the note and he said but then I would, you know, come up with a different version of a solution. He said, yeah, OK, that 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 works. Exactly. Or I say, I really want to keep that bit. He said, OK, well, there might be tr maybe try and sort of put this spin on it. Um, uh, and so it was really, um, you know, I had a lot of space, but at the same time, it was very focused 
and very uh, productive um, and had a big effect on the, the way both the script and the film turned out. Yeah, I love that. And the way it turned out it, it is incredible. How did you decide that this was going to be a short versus, oh, I could just take you know, the, the novella as a basis and turn it into a two hour feature film? Well, actually there was a long, <laughs> I did write a long script <laughs> at one point, but um, I mean, Alfonso was convinced that it worked better as a shorter story, you know, keep people wanting more. Um, and that it had a kind of a beauty as the short story did. It's sort of like, a, you know, he said, it's a little gem, keep it as a little gem. Um, but I think what I and also that fitted into his into his series. Um, I think the series, the idea of the series was they were were holiday shorts. Um, and uh, and I was very pleased to be, uh, you know, joining um, with Disney Plus on Alfonso's series, because, you know, that's a perfect way to deliver this this story into people's homes so that they can watch together at, at at Christmas, um, but I think what what happened with the with me having written the longer version was I did sort of keep some of those things that I discovered in in how would I how would I elaborate the story. And in particular, I, I sort of um, developed a backstory which was about the troubled relationship um, between Freddie and his dead father. The idea that he sort of felt pressured by the fact that his father was, in his mind, a war hero that he could never live up to. Whereas in fact, he discovers in the course of the story, not wanting to give too much away, that that's not what his father's generation were motivated by when they were um, when they were signing up as pilots in the Second World War. That it was something, again, much more of a communal collaboration of sticking together um, uh, with your uh, compatriots um, and the people in your community, um, and I was inspired actually partly because when I when I um, did, wrote the adaptation, it was during COVID, and I think that was a great leveler. I think people did help each other out and did make self self sacrifices for other people. So the line, you know, there's a line in the film um, that I wrote as a response to that, which is, "Let's hope we never have to live like." through anything like that again. Um, and I was kind of in my mind both referring to the to the COVID epidemic as much as it, as much as anything else. And of course, you know, things come round um, and we always have challenges uh, in each, each generation. But um, also the, the, the idea of Lizzie, she's not in the book that came out of um, the, uh, the longer script, um, the prologue in the base and the fact that um, Freddie uh, uh, is is a last minute recruit to step in to take the place of another pilot who's more experienced than he is, who was supposed to fly the last plane home. So all of these things were in the longer script <clears throat> and they were not in the book. So uh, I kept them <clears throat> and managed to shoehorn them in, in a very economical way, hopefully into the, into the, uh, into the shorter film. And a last question, in case people haven't had the chance to watch The Shepherd, is there one thing about the film that stands out for you that would make someone check it out or watch it for a second time? Uh, I think the first time around, there's a couple of twists. And I put in an extra twist from the book, um, which uh, people that have seen it so far seem to respond to. Um, and I think that if you then watch the film the second time round with the twist knowing already what the twist is going to be it makes you kind of like see some of those scenes uh in a different in a different light this is sounding very ambiguous because i don't want to give the end <laughs> um, uh, i think it's just the way that you know i hoped the story would land uh for audiences in the way that it landed for me when i first read the novella i love that Ian, thank you so much for that incredible conversation. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you to our friends at Disney Plus. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. Thank you. I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much.